staff cleaned out the, uh, all the refrigerators over the week. And um, fortunately, stroke of luck, the cleaning crew did not empty the trash cans. And so I found some really good stuff for lunch. And um, <laughs> I wanted to get a hold of it before the rest of the staff. I've got some, I've got some cold cuts. They expired a couple of months ago. But uh, hey, it's free stuff, right? Um, Found some chocolate milk, expiration date of October 28th. But uh, hey, waste not, won't not, right? And the piece de resistance, a uh, egg, ham, and cheese sandwich that's been sitting out for a couple of days. And uh, it, it's literally green eggs and ham. But I will eat it, Sam. I am because. So so Joy and I got lunch, and uh, so I, I just got sidetracked with that. You know, if you care about me, you'd probably catch me after the service and go, um, "Alan, don't eat that stuff." Because if you eat that stuff, you're gonna get real sick. Now, if you don't like me, you're gonna walk out and go, "I hope he eats the whole stinking thing." But if you care about me, you're going to stop. Anybody ever had food poisoning before? If you've had it, you don't forget it. It is, it is horrible. And what's happened over the, over the years is, you know, you get, you get a little bit of smarts, and after a while you learn, I'm just not going to eat anything. I'm going to learn to protect my stomach from, and my body from what I put in it. I mean, that comes with wisdom, right? You just you figure that out, all right? You know, and if you, if you care about someone, you won't let them eat stuff like that. You know, as a pastor, I care about you. And I care not just about what you put in your stomach. I care about what you put in your heart. In Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse 23, it says this. Guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it are the sources of life. And when I'm talking about heart, I'm not talking about your blood pump. I'm talking about your spirit, your inner man. And I'm talking about guarding that. He said, for the sources of life flow out of that. Strength and joy and peace flow out of our heart. And when we're stronger in our heart, we're stronger to handle the stuff that happens in life. How many of you have ever been to a beautiful place? Maybe you went for a vacation and you, man, it's just a gorgeous place, but you weren't happy on the inside. And when you weren't happy and doing well on the inside, you could be the most beautiful place. Joyce said she went a number of years ago with her mom to, um, to Italy, and they went to the island of Capri. And she said, Joyce said, it's probably one of the most beautiful islands I have ever seen, places, period. She said, but I was hurting because of some things going on in the family. She said, couldn't even enjoy it. How many of you know what goes on on the inside is going to impact what goes on on the outside? And so you wouldn't let me eat this stuff. Let me give you three things that are bad for your heart today. Three things you want to remove and you just, you just don't want to have because they're, they're going to hurt you. They're going to hurt your heart. The first one's fear. What it says here in the scriptures and Proverbs. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. That word anxiety, another word for that is apprehension. Apprehension is a sense of dread about what's coming for the future. And when there's a sense of dread, I mean, if you're expecting something bad, another translation say it can weigh your heart down. And it can just, it can wear on you. And you're expecting something bad, and it, man, it just, it, it'll take its toll. But the Bible said a good word makes it glad. That's why I encourage you to read God's word. God's word is the good word that can actually change your expectations and change what you see. Fear will wear you down. Gladness will make you strong. You don't want fear in your heart. The second thing you don't want in your heart is sorrow. Again, let's go back to Proverbs. A mere heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. By sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Sorrow saps strength from us. It pulls strength down. And there's nothing in, in the scriptures that say, hey, listen, when you're sorry, you're strong. 
In fact, it says just the opposite. It says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so that idea of having sorrow, if you have sorrow and sadness and grief in your heart, well, I'm telling you, it can, it's not helping you. It's stealing strength from you. Then here's the last one you don't want in your heart. We talk about what we put in our stomach, but there's some things we don't want in our heart, and it's anger. Anger, again, going to Psalms this time, it says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, that only causes harm. Keep that scripture up there just for a second. All three of those words mean anger. That, word, that first word, anger, that's that hot anger, and actually it implies when your nostrils flare. So it, it, it means when your nostrils flaring anger. Forsake wrath. Wrath is that rage that has just built up its anger to the extreme, but the word fret is the word that means to burn. You ever heard people talk about just a slow burn, man? I got, I got a slow burn going on. And anger, all of those words are anger and said, don't do it. Thank you, guys. Don't do it. It only causes harm. So all of these things, fear and sadness and, and anger are stuff that you ought not to put in your heart, just like I ought not to drink expired milk because it isn't going to do me any good. Mickey Mantle was a famous baseball player for the New York Yankees in the 50s and 60s. He had a big friend named Billy Martin. Billy wasn't as good as, Bill, as, as Mickey Mantle. But he was a hothead, became a, a well-known manager. I think he worked for the Yankees about 10 times. They fired him and hired him and fired him. But he was a hothead. And, uh, but Mickey and Billy were close. When they both retired from playing, uh, uh, Billy became a manager for the Rangers and actually turned the Rangers around. They gave him a rifle as a, as a present. And uh, Billy told Mickey, he said, man, I want to I go deer hunting with this, my new rifle. And they were up in Dallas at the time. Mickey was living there. He said, well, I got a friend down uh, south of San Antonio. He's got a ranch. He's a doctor. He's got a ranch. We'll go down there. He said, we'll have to get up real early because it's about a four-hour drive. So they got up early. They drove down there, pulled into the ranch house. And Mickey told Billy, he said, you sit in the car. He said, I'll go talk to the doctor and make sure it's okay for us to hunt. So Mickey knocks on the door. The doctor sees him. Hey, Mickey. Mickey Mantle was famous. Hey, Mickey, good to see you. He said, Doc, I just wanted to see if we could hunt some deer on your ranch. And the doctor said, no, no problem at all. I got Billy. Said, Billy, you and Billy can hunt. Wonderful. He said, Mickey, would you do me a favor? He said, do you see that old mule over there? There was a mule just kind of standing there. He said, that old mule, he said, he's old. He's gone blind. He hadn't done any decent work in 10 years. He said, I don't have the heart to put that mule down. He said, would you put that mule down for me? Mickey said, I don't want to shoot your mule. He said, no, I, seriously, I don't have the heart to do it. Somebody needs to put that mule out of his, his misery. Would you do that for me while you're hunting? He said, okay, I'll do it. So Mickey is walking back to the car. He decides to play a trick on Billy Martin. This is a true story. So he goes back to the car, and he puts this mad look on his face, and he gets in, and he gets in, he slams the door, and he says, I can't believe that guy. We drove four hours down here, and he tells me he doesn't want us to hunt on his ranch. It just makes me so mad. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to shoot his mule. Give me my rifle. And he grabbed his rifle, and Billy said, no, Mickey, don't, don't shoot his mule. We'll go to jail for that. Don't do that. He said, give me my rifle. And he took his rifle, and he got out of the car, walked over to the edge of the farm, and shot the mule. And then he heard three more shots. And he looked over, and Billy had this look on his face. He said, I got three of his cows. <laughs> True story. And here's, here's the thing. Ang anger, anger is infectious, and I use that word intentionally. It's not it's just contagious, it is infectious. In fact, the Bible warns us, it said, don't let the sun go down on your, what, wrath? You've ever heard that one? Don't let the sun go down your anger. You know, I was looking at that verse. I share that almost every wedding that I do. When I do weddings, I give a little bit of, of marriage advice, and some of my marriage advice is I say to all the guys, I say, I said, well, both of them. I said, learn to say I'm sorry and say it a lot. And I looked at the guy and said, especially you, because we're always wrong. I said, and I said, I said, but learn not to go to bed angry. And Joy and I have tried to practice that for years. Don't go to bed angry. But do you realize that's not taken in a marriage context? It's taken for life. Don't go to bed angry, period. In other words, anger keeps about as well 
is this green eggs and ham sandwich. It doesn't keep well at all. And the Bible warns us, get rid of it. Our creator who knows us tells us how to, he said, don't hang on to this. It's going to cause harm. There was a time when the disciples got angry. They were walking with Jesus and they had to go through Samaria. Samaria, if you can, if you can picture a map, if we're looking on a map, down here is, is Judea and then there's Samaria right above it and then right above it is Galilee where Jesus grew up. And so oftentimes the Jewish people, if they had to go to Galilee or from Galilee down, they had to go through Samaria. Oftentimes they would go around it because if you think the Democrats and Republicans hate each other, you have no idea how much the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. Live right next to each other, couldn't stand each other. There was prejudice, there was religious pride. I mean, this was not, this was not a good thing. And so Jesus and his disciples are coming evidently from Galilee. They're coming through Samaria. They're heading toward Jerusalem. Let's see what happens. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord... Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You don't know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. These Samaritans had rejected Jesus, even though Jesus was someone who was actually good to them. Jesus never criticized the Samaritans. In fact, we find that one time Jesus went through a Samaritan village and the very first person he ever revealed himself to as the Messiah was the Samaritan woman. And then he stayed in that town for two more days and these Samaritans just, man, they found the Christ, the Messiah. It was an amazing time. Jesus was very good to the Samaritans. He did not criticize them. He wasn't prejudiced against them. He didn't say unkind things about them and their religion. But their religious tradition and their racial prejudice blinded them as to who Jesus was. And if they had known who Jesus was, they could have just simply go, oh my gosh, this is Jesus, the healer, the miracle worker, the one who's just, who loves us and is so good to us. But their tradition and their, and their racial prejudice blinded them. And because Jesus, simply because Jesus' face was set south toward Jerusalem, they rejected him, wouldn't let him stay in the village. Well, I want to tell you something, that made John and James mad. Jesus called them the sons of thunder. And so they were, oh man, they were, they were angry. And you know what? Because they felt that sting of rejection, they felt it personally. You see, they had abandoned their businesses and they staked their whole future on this one man, Jesus. So you talk about identifying with someone, they identified with Jesus. And man, when they rejected Jesus, that was worse than rejecting them and they felt that sting. And they did one smart thing. At least they asked Jesus a question because they knew he was going to go along with it, because they knew he was angry too. They said, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and wipe out this whole village? <laughs> Just consume them. And they even had scripture. See, Elijah, 2 Kings, Elijah had prophesied something negative about the king. In fact, they told the king, you're going to die. The king didn't like it. The king sent two groups of 50 men to take Elijah. They were going to harm him. And Elijah, one of them said, man of God, come down. And Elijah goes, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and burn you up. <laughs> Burned up two groups of 50. So these boys thought, bless God, we've got some spiritual precedent here. We've got a religious right and we're going to burn this whole group up in Jesus' name. But the problem was the, the group of men that came after Elijah came to harm him. The Samaritan village didn't harm Jesus. They simply rejected him. And so Jesus didn't join with their anger. He guarded his heart. And Jesus looked, actually he turned and rebuked James and John. Rebuked me as he spoke to him real sternly. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. And he brought them back to the big picture. He said, the big picture, guys, is I came to save lives, not to destroy them. 
And I love that last verse in that passage. And they went to another village. They just moved on. You say, Alan, why do you share this? I share this because I've, as a pastor I've watched over the months, as fear and sorrow and anger have seemed to take hold of so many people, so many believers, so many good Christians, and they put some things in their heart that shouldn't be there. So I want to talk to you just a little bit. How do you protect your heart? How do you strengthen your heart? Because you don't want this stuff in. It's worse for your heart than this food would be for my stomach. Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues, the sources of life. How do we protect our heart? Well, there's an old adage. You've probably heard this one. You are what you eat. And whatever you feed on, it's in you. Look at this verse in Psalms. Do not fret, there's that slow burn anger, because of evildoers, nor be envious for the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Now, right, just stop right there. That's not a verse for you to pray. Don't be praying, Lord, cut them down like grass and wither them like a green herb. You don't, you don't want to pray that. What it's talking about is how temporary man is and how temporary life is. The Bible says all flesh is as grass and the glory of man like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. He said, so what, what are we going to do? We're not going to fret. We're not going to be angry because evildoers and people are upset. He said, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So it gives us something different to feed on. So here's the, here's the thing. If you're constantly, if you're constantly partaking of things that are hurting you, constantly feeding on things, whatever you're thinking about all the time and feeding on, man, it, it, it's going to get in you. And fear and anxiety, man, you, you feed on things that are negative and fear will get in you or sorrow will get in you. And, and, and I've heard people say, well, you know what, Alan, you obviously don't know what's going on in our country. I got a right to be mad. I'm not trying to take away your right to be angry, but I'm asking the question, is it helping you? Is it is it changing the situation or is it changing you? So what are you going to do? Well, this gives us something to do. It says, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. Hey, guys, well, I continue to trust in the Lord. Regardless of what's going on in our country, God hasn't changed. And he's still one we can trust in. So I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to do good. I'm going to dwell on the land, and I'm going to feed on his faithfulness. What does that mean, feed on his faithfulness? What I consistently think about and talk about is what I'm feeding on. So I'm going to feed on how good God is, how faithful he is, how strong he is, how joy shared, how big he is. I'm going to think about those things. Those things feed me. Those things help me. The other things hurt me. Now, when this pandemic started, I had, a, I had just the Lord impressed on my heart back in, back in March. He impressed on my heart to put the news away, to stop watching news and reading news. And so for, for since March, I bet you I haven't watched an hour's worth of news. You say, well, you don't know what's going on. I know a lot what's going on. I can scan headlines and look at things real quickly. But I, I haven't watched news. And you know why? I don't want to feed on that. I don't want to put that in my heart. And this week, I found a scripture for not watching the news. I'm serious. I found one. Look, I want you to see it. It's in Ezekiel. Sigh, therefore, son of man, with a breaking heart, and sigh with bitterness before their eyes. And it shall be when they say to you, why are you sighing? That you shall answer, because of the news. <laughs> That's a real Bible verse. That is for real. And look what it says. When it comes... Every heart will melt, all hands will be feeble, every spirit will faint, and all knees will be weak as water. Guys, I have watched that take place with people angry and fearful and negative because the news is negative. You don't even know if it's true all the time. I'm just saying there's a, something else we can feed on, and it's the faithfulness and goodness of God. So now I've got scripture. Yeah. You want, to, you want to protect your heart. What are you, what are you feeding on? Here's the second thing you want to do. You want to be able to strengthen your heart. To strengthen your heart. You, you want to get stronger in that area. 
And to get stronger, you have to learn to be comfortable with uncomfortable. Now, let me explain that. I'm going to show you scripture first, and I'll explain that. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I was watching a, a YouTube. You know, I, 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 there's, I thank God for some YouTube stuff. I mean, now we don't have to go find some. I mean, YouTube has got, they'll, they'll tell you everything to do. How to, how to make sandwiches, how to, how to do just a bunch of things. Well, there's an online trainer. Instead of me going to a trainer, if you're a trainer, I, I know it's better to go. But I'm online. <laughs> and anyway, just saying. And I, uh, there's a trainer I follow. It has 11 million followers. This guy's master's degree. He's a, he's a really, he's a good trainer, physical trainer. And he said something a few weeks ago. I thought, whew, that was really good. He said, if you're trying to get stronger, if you're trying to build and trying to grow, he said, you have to be comfortable with uncomfortable. He said, you can't just go and, and work out. And, and if you leave, he said, if you leave refreshed, you haven't worked out. You work out like Joy works out. I go to Joy one time to go, and I finally, she went to the YMCA, and she was there. She didn't know I was there. I watched her. I'm telling you, she sat there at the, at the bench press. She probably put on, if they had negative weight, she'd have had it on. And she, and she was just standing there. She was smiling at everybody. Just looking around, she looks so peaceful and calm. <laughs> I find this, I, I stopped bothering her. She, she, she told me, fine, you want me to work out? I'm going to work out my way, and, which wasn't working out. He, so <laughs> be comfortable. He said, if you're going to work out, he said, you really need to walk out of their tired spent. Just thought I'd share that with you. I, th I thought it was good. You say, well, what in the world has that got to do with anything? Because can I tell you, it, you know, it's easier to give in to fear and sorrow and anger. It's easier to do that. It, it, it has no resistance. Thanksgiving has a resistance to it. If you begin to be thankful, it's almost like swimming upstream. Maybe that's why they call it a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. If you, if you haven't given thanks much before, and we're, did you honestly think you will get through the, the Sunday before Thanksgiving without me talking about Thanksgiving? Come on. We're going to talk about Thanksgiving for a little bit because it is something that has resistance to it. But if you become comfortable with uncomfortable, it can help you. It will actually strengthen your heart because what Thanksgiving does is it takes our focus off what is wrong onto all the things that are right. It takes our focus off of the negative and the temporary to the positive and to the eternal. John Kralek was a man who was unhappy with his life. He was, he had burned through two marriages. He wasn't connected with his kids. He had a law practice he wasn't making any money at. He was just working long hours. And he was really so discouraged that he began to recall some of the words of advice that his grandfather gave him years ago. His grandfather had put a big emphasis on gratitude. And John Kralek realized, if, if I'm going to make a change, I need to make something drastic. So he made a goal that he was going to write 365 thank you notes within a 12-month period. Be one a day. He said the very first thing he noticed quickly was that his attitude and his circumstances began to change for the better. He kept up. He made his goal. In fact, it changed him so much he wrote a book called A Simple Act of Gratitude, How Learning to Say Thank You Changed My Life. What he said was this, though, one of his useful points is what he said was this. He said, one of the things, the first things you'll recognize, he said, when you begin to be thankful is that your life is a lot better than you thought it was. See, what Thanksgiving does is it focuses on what's good. You begin to focus on things. And if you just stop and begin to say, look, and people say, well, I don't, I don't have anything to be thankful for. We got a lot to be thankful for. I'm thankful. That I'm thankful for God. I'm thankful he sent Jesus to die for my sins. Thankful that he raised him from the dead. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit lives in me. I'm thankful that I have a wonderful wife. I'm thankful that I got a good family. I'm thankful I get to pastor a wonderful church and a wonderful town and a wonderful state. I'm very blessed to be here. Listen, I realize there's things going on in our country, but I would not want to live anywhere else than where we live right now, right here. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm glad if you're thankful.
And thankful pulls our focus away from the negative and it puts our focus on what's right. I don't know if some of you remember, but early March, Joy had a word for the church. She said, I get these words. Thank God and take courage. This was in March. This is before things begin to break down. And she, uh, I, I see now the wisdom in her words. Thank God and take courage. Thanksgiving, the sacrifice of Thanksgiving, strengthens our heart. And the last thing is this. We have to stay with the big picture. The big picture. The big picture is the salvation of mankind and the advancement of God's kingdom and what our role is in that. I've been doing pastoring for years, 24, almost 25 now. And I've done a lot of funerals over the years. You know, I've, I've, I've never had this ever happen to me one time. I could be standing maybe by the casket before the service started, and I've had people slide up to me. And I've never had anyone do this. Alan, yes, sir. Do you know whether he was a Democrat or a Republican? No one's ever asked me that. You know what they do ask me? Alan, did you know the Lord? And if I go, yeah, you know what they all do? <sighs> Good. Because when we're at that place, that's all that matters. Salvation of mankind, the help, the ark, the Bible. When we started the ark, it was started off one scripture, for the saving of households. And we are still here for the saving of households. So we, we have to keep our, our eyes on the big picture. We have to keep our, our focus there. And you know what that does? That's good, it's good for your heart. And I love what Jesus did. And they went to another village, and he simply moved on. I think it's time for some of us just to move on and to move on from some of the things that have hurt us. So remember those cards you got? Would you pull them out? If you pull them out and, and fold it and tear it in half. As you do, I want you to, I want you to think about something, and, and don't put your name on it. I want you to think about something maybe that has been weighing on your heart or has gotten in your heart. Maybe it's fear and apprehension about what's coming. Maybe it's, it's sorrow about some loss or some difficulties you've had in the past. This has been a tough year. Maybe it's, it's, it's anger about some of the wrong and injustice that you see taking place. Maybe it's all three. But I'd just like you maybe to write that down on that card. Again, don't put your name on it. Just say, you know, fear of this or anger because of this. And when you leave, I want you just to to ball it up, crumple it up. Don't worry, we're not gonna we're not gonna count them or recount them. Um, <laughs> we're um, but I want you to to say, you know what? I, I want the Lord to help me to get rid of this. I'm gonna throw it away. But on the other hand, I want you to think of, of something, preferably three things that you are thankful to God for. And write them down. Now, I don't want you to throw that one away. I want you to keep it. And maybe during the course of the week, pull it out. This is this Thanksgiving. You got children, that'd be a good thing to go over. What, what are they thankful for? Helping your ch children develop a thankfulness, a gratitude. Just take a moment and do that and just write down what you're thankful and you can keep that. We have trash cans very at the end of the, uh, of the service that we out there in the, in the front. As you go, Let's get rid of some things that are, that are not helping our heart. Let's hold on to what will, and let's thank God. I'm going to ask if you would, if you're writing, you can continue to write, but if you would bow your heads, those of you who are finished, you bow your heads just for a moment. This morning, if you're here or watching online, you say, Alan, you know, I, I've, I've gotten away from, from the Lord, or I never really had a relationship with him, but I'd like to have a relationship with him someone who's that good and that kind and that loving, I really need in my life. Well, we're going to say a prayer. We're not going to have you, if you're here and 
certainly not going to have you stand up or come to the front if you're watching online. Uh, this is a prayer you can pray quietly with us. If you're around a lot of other people, you can just pray to yourself, but we'll, we'll pray this prayer with you. I am going to ask you, though, if you're here, to acknowledge it and say, Alan, that's me. And uh, I know I need the Lord in my life, or I know I need to come back to him. I, I want to be in on this prayer. Would you pray for me? Just real quickly slip your hand up across the auditorium. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your courage. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray. If you didn't lift your hand and wanted to, you can still jump in on this prayer. We're going to pray it with you out loud. Pray with us as a church family. Say, dear God, I know mankind needs a Savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, I'm very thankful for those online, those who are here who prayed that prayer, who've made a commitment or a recommitment to you, and we rejoice with them. Now, Father, thank you for the, for the rest of us, those who have been walking with you. Thank you for showing us how to protect, how to guard our hearts so that your joy, your peace, your love, your strength flows out of us and is a blessing to those around us and a blessing to those who don't know you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Mm -hmm.